Hi, hi everyone. Uh, thanks for coming to our talk. I know it's Friday morning, the last day of the conference. Uh, must have been uh, uh, a lot of good talks over the last few days. Uh, we are going to talk about uh, securing third-party apps in a marketplace ecosystem. My name is Hari. I lead the ecosystem security team in Atlassian. We also have Jana here, who is in my team. Uh, and our main focus is just ensuring that our Atlassian ecosystem is secure. Uh, so what is, what is a marketplace ecosystem? Uh, uh, it, it's, it's not a pretty common word, but it's pretty prevalent in the industry. And like a lot of companies have their own uh, app stores. Uh, app stores and marketplaces are synonyms, I would say. Uh, a marketplace is just a, a, a place where third-party developers can list their apps to trade. So they're essentially selling services to customers uh, on our platforms. Like in, this case, in, the, in the case of Atlassian, it's the Atlassian marketplace. And typically, when you say app stores, uh, you, you get reminded of the Apple App Store or the Google Play Store, but there's a ton more. Uh, a lot of enterprise software companies have their own app stores and play stores, sorry, app stores and marketplaces, uh, and uh, that enables their business and a ton of other businesses around the world. Uh, but then what is an ecosystem then? Like, why do we use the term ecosystem? Um, that's where sort of the uh, collection of apps come to, comes into picture. A platform by itself will not be able to solve all the different problems that a customer would want to solve. And that's where a collection of apps, which itself make an ecosystem, help a customer solve a ton of different problems they want to solve by building on top of the platform, by using the platform. And that's another reason why all these enterprise software marketplaces are, um, are uh, investing in having a healthy and uh, secure uh, marketplace and an ecosystem uh, 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 that, that supports their platforms. The Atlassian marketplace is a pretty big marketplace. We have one of the largest enterprise software marketplaces. Uh, uh, it caters to many different products, uh, Jira, Confluence, Bitbucket, and uh, we also have well over 4,000 total apps, uh, more than 4,000 apps uh, on like different like cloud, server, data center uh, uh, products. Uh, and, uh, and we have sold over uh, a lifetime sales of about $1 billion. So uh, our apps have, have generated a billion dollars in sales in the last six to seven years. So it's, it's quite a business by a big business by itself, and it's enabling a ton of different companies to, to grow and develop. Uh, we also have well over 1,000 third-party uh, vendors and uh, developers on the platform. So essentially, these are people who are listing their apps in our marketplace. Uh, what are the typical stakeholders in a marketplace ecosystem? Right? Um, when it comes to the Atlassian marketplace, uh, Atlassian is, is what you call the marketplace owner. We own the marketplace. We are enabling all these uh, vendors to come and list their apps. And it also generates revenue for us. In some cases, it doesn't. But then why would a company think about uh, uh, a marketplace which doesn't generate them revenue, it's primarily for product stickiness. Think of a customer who uses your product and then a 10 other apps on top of your product that is listed in your marketplace. It, it, it really serves for that product stickiness and ensures that the customer gets a lot of value from your marketplace, uh, from your platform, and it also makes sort of migration difficult. So it, it serves a lot for product stickiness and it's very important for the business in general. The other big stakeholder is the marketplace partners, the people who actually list apps in the marketplace. Uh, these are independent software vendors who try to either make a profit or like create a business, uh, or they're just there for a hobby. They, they, they figured out a solution. They are like, OK, let me try out this app in the marketplace and see if, if this can be, become a legitimate business uh, and, and see if I can grow from here kind of a thing. So that's another sort of persona in a, uh, in a marketplace ecosystem. Then obviously there is the customer who is who's there, who wants to solve a bunch of problems they have, who don't really want to go buy 20 different things and try to integrate each one of them together. So they, are, they really want to have a healthy and uh, uh, working marketplace ecosystem uh, that their platform supports. Now comes the, the security challenge part. How do you secure such a diverse ecosystem? How do you secure such a, uh, a, 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 such a, a big ecosystem, I would say, a, a big problem space? Uh, the first big question, if you have a marketplace, uh, is to think of who actually owns the risk, who actually is responsible to ensuring that the marketplace is secure and the marketplace uh, partners are investing in security. Uh, is it a shared responsibility amongst the, all the three stakeholders? Or is it the customer who owns the, rink, uh, who owns, who owns the risk? At the end of the day, uh, the customer is the one who is having sort of a legal relationship with the marketplace partner, right? So would you call... Uh, would you say the customer owns the risk? Or is it the marketplace owner who's solely responsible for this? Like, 
we, uh, for a classic marketplace, we own the marketplace, we let people list their apps, uh, and uh, we let them make money, and we also make money on top of it, right? So that's sort of a, a sort of a conundrum of things that you need to think about when you are thinking about securing your own marketplace. And each has its own pros and cons. Uh, let's take the customer approach. You're sort of passing the buck to the customer. You're saying that, hey, uh, you're on your own. Uh, you are, you're using 50 apps, well and good. Do 50 security reviews and 50 procurement reviews. And, and that doesn't gel well, right? Like, uh, you need to take some resp responsibility. But if you, as a marketplace owner, try, try to take the entire responsibility, then like, where does the buck stop? Like, I mean, uh, are you going to invest a ton into every single company's security review and security uh, posture improvements? So there is, a, there is a bunch of things that you need to think about uh, when you're securing a marketplace ecosystem. The other is sort of the, the variety and scale. Uh, like I mentioned before, at least in the Atlassian marketplace, uh, there is a variety of companies. Some companies make, a bill, make billions of dollars, right? Like, uh, sorry, millions of dollars. I wish they did, billions. Uh, <laughs> make millions of dollars. Some companies are like, like just one person shops, they put out an app and it became popular and customers love it. Uh, but they, they don't really have the resources and funding to invest in security. And some of them are like hobby apps. Like, uh, hey, I found the solution. I created the solution. Let me share it with the community, and uh, let's see let's see where this leads us. So that's a, sort of another uh, uh, challenge with securing a marketplace. The other big challenge is, is the technical challenges. It's it's almost a black box. Um, more often than not, these apps have a supporting web app or service that runs outside of Atlassian in, in the Atlassian marketplace case. There is no source code available. Like, uh, these are like these consume RESTful APIs, and uh, they end up hosting outside of Atlassian. So, so where does the scope of your assurance activity stop? Like, do you stop just with testing the app? Do you go a little bit beyond and go to the uh, service and test the service? Or do you think about the security of the company as a whole? Because at the end of the day, if the company is compromised, uh, their customer data is compromised, right? Uh, so these are the kinds of things that, that, that you should be thinking about when you, are, when you are trying to secure a marketplace ecosystem. So what is happening in the industry today? Like so, so we went around and kind of uh, based on public documentation and, and talks and conferences uh, uh, and all those things, we kind of gathered uh, there are three primary approaches that the industry is taking today to secure marketplaces. And this is specifically about enterprise software marketplaces. The, the Google uh, Play Store and Apple App Store model are a little different because they have a ton more funding, they make a lot more money, and the, the sort of uh, 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 threat models are a little different. Like, so when it comes to enterprise software marketplaces, uh, one of the uh, approaches we have seen is putting security gates before the app is even listed in the marketplace. Uh, so there is a, it's a bunch of security activities that happen. You test for security vulnerabilities, you ask for a few reports, uh, you review all of them, and you only allow to list the app in the marketplace if they have, uh, so what do you call, uh, met some of the security requirements we have put through. Uh, there is also sort of a re-review that happens, at least annually, uh, and, 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 and during major changes. Like, it's really unclear how major changes are defined because it's still a black box, and how much can you know about that black box? The second big approach we have seen is uh, security gates based on the permissions requested by the app. Um, this is essentially blocking access to restric restricted and sensitive scopes and permissions to the apps and mandating certain security activities to happen. So the same security tests, the same document reviews, uh, vendor security reviews, all those things happen uh, based on the sensitivity of the permissions requested by the app. Uh, for to uh, accomplish this, the platforms we saw have invested heavily to support uh, granular permissions. So uh, think of the likes of Slack and G Suite and all those companies. There is a their, their, their APIs support many granular permissions, and there is a way for them to sort of uh, uh, classify permissions based on sensitivity. Uh, the third big approach we have seen is uh, keeping it open, not putting any gates, but then positively signaling apps which are investing in security. So the app gets a security badge if they do a pen test. The app gets a security badge if they perform, uh, 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 get passed in a vendor security review. Uh, so essentially, leave, sort of taking some responsibility, but then uh, leaving it to the customer to decide based on the data that we provide to the customer. Each approach has its own pros and cons, and each approach has its own business and security impact. Like for example, if you take the first approach, you're probably uh, blocking apps by uh, like, I mean, taking a bunch of time before 
uh, it gets approved in the marketplace. So a turnaround time of weeks and months and whatnot, right? Uh, so you should be thinking about these approaches as you are uh, trying to secure a marketplace. Uh, so how is Atlassian doing it? Uh, that's something Jana will cover. Thank you. Yeah, so I'm going to share a little bit about how uh, we at Atlassian have chosen to tackle this problem, the large problem of securing an ecosystem marketplace, um, and some of the challenges that we have encountered along the way. Uh, but before I do that, I just want to briefly cover the overall fundamental overarching goals that we've set for ourselves as a team and uh, that we're working towards and that influence our day-to-day uh, -day work and choices that we make. And so obviously the first uh, goal that kind of goes without saying is we're doing this ultimately to protect customer data. And as uh, some of you may know, uh, people, uh, customers put a lot of very sensitive data into Atlassian products like Jira or Confluence. There's a lot of uh, really critical data that goes in. And there is uh, on the platform level uh, security measures around that. But the moment you start installing uh, third-party apps, uh, integrations, that's where um, kind of the uh, attack surface becomes much, much bro broader and it becomes much harder to track where the data is going. And uh, we want to make sure that customer data is protected along that path and that the customer has all the information they need to make informed decisions around that. And so in order to achieve that, uh, it's important for us to have um, a, a pathway towards continuous security monitoring and review of these apps. So we want to have good visibility into what's going on in the marketplace. Um, you know, are these apps secure? You know, we want to have continuous assessments and really emphasis on continuous. We don't want to just like test and forget, but we want to have really robust processes in place. Um, but at the same time, we also realize that uh, we cannot um, ultimately be kind of this entity that dictates how these partners and vendors do security. Because again, these are partners, they are their own independent businesses, they have um, their own um, business plan, and we are, uh, while we can help them, we can ultimately tell them exactly how to do this. On the other hand, we can give them the tools and the incentives and uh, um, education to make the right choice and uh, do uh, the right thing in terms of security. So that's kind of the direction we want to go. Uh, we want to partner up versus uh, telling them exactly how to run security. And then uh, finally, on the other side of the spectrum, you have marketplace apps, but then there is also the problem of uh, we want to make sure that uh, the platform, the developer framework that we offer by default is secure and provides uh, developers uh, with uh, a way to create secure apps um, out of the box, essentially. Okay, so these are the goals. Um, so. As we kind of embarked on this journey of uh, securing the marketplace um, ecosystem, uh, the first major problem we've uh, tackled is, um, you know, how do we bring the entire uh, marketplace apps, uh, uh, you know, um, scope to, to a minimum level of security? So as Hari had mentioned, there's a lot of diversity in the Atlassian marketplace. There is small apps, big apps, anything in between. You know, uh, some companies are run by one person, then you have... Uh, hundreds of people in other companies, and uh, there's a lot of uh, differences in between, and so it's hard to standardize um, across the board, and of course, different apps have different functionalities and access different data as well, so uh, that was a big challenge, and our solution to that was uh, to come up with a list of uh, security requirements. So, I know it only shows three, but there's actually a little bit more, like 12, very specific, um, very concrete and testable, uh, security controls that we want for all the marketplace vendors to implement uh, as a minimum. So this is not like a comprehensive list uh, that guarantees that the apps are secure, but this is just to give customers when they install apps a level of assurance that this is the level of security you're going to get at the very least. Um, and also uh, the, this kind of helps partners to understand what we're looking for in terms of security and help them prioritize uh, security work as well. Uh, so it kind of brings everyone on the same page. So that was kind of the first step, and it's an iterative process, and uh, this is a living document that will improve over time, but it's kind of the step towards standardization. The next uh, challenge we've had was around uh, scalability. So, uh, you know, how do we scale application security testing across all the multitude of uh, marketplace apps and do it continuously, right? Like, as a team, even if we could and had enough people to do testing, it would pretty much be all we do, and we had to do it over and over again, and there's just 
uh, no resources for that, right? So the way we solved that was by using bug bounty. Um, so as a little of a background, Atlassian already has a very successful bug bounty program on one of the larger uh, bug bounty platforms out there. Right? So we chose to extend that to our um, partners in the marketplace uh, by uh, offering them to, or giving them the ability to spin up um, bug bounty programs um, independently. Right? So Atlassian in this model would uh, be kind of the sponsor where we pay um, for the cost of the platform uh, services and triage, uh, and the partner, uh, they have their own independent bug bounty instance, and then they handle the intake, they do remediation, and then they pay for vulnerabilities that, they, that the researchers find in this case. And uh, despite some of the fears, you know, people tend to be apprehensive about offering or exposing their apps to, to the crowd, but uh, in actuality, it actually turns out that this is a cheaper way for vendors to, or for partners to um, get started with security. It's a, a low barrier to entry because you do only pay per vulnerability, especially like if you compare to something like traditional pen testing that can be pretty expensive. Here you only pay for valid findings and uh, it's flexible to scale. So you can start really small with a limited set of researchers and then you can uh, scale up as you feel more comfortable. But the most important benefit of this is uh, the fact that um, by, kind of by uh, handling the intake, by doing payouts, uh, this kind of gives the partners a sense of ownership of security. So it's not us um, dictating and telling them where to fix what, but it's kind of uh, them handling that process. And that's kind of what we want to achieve, uh, and that's the direction we want to go. So, um, so there's that. Uh, I also want to talk a little bit about the other part of it all, which is the platform, right? So um, there's, of course, a lot of elements to this and it kind of tangents more into product security space, um, you know, uh, engineering embedding and education and all that. So I'm not going to talk about that, but um, I want to illustrate the point of how, how do we make the platform more secure based on the security requirements from our customers and uh, from vendors uh, by giving an example of what Atlassian had done. So um, originally at Atlassian, the way you develop apps in the marketplace uh, is you as a developer can pick um, any language and uh, host, develop your app and then host it in uh, any way you see fit. Uh, so that gives a lot of flexibility and then that seamlessly integrates into the Atlassian product. And uh, while it's great because there's a lot of flexibility, you can kind of focus on the languages you know best and technologies you know best, it does um, have a burden of um, you know, giving a lot of security work to, to the partners, right? Because then they have to worry about data storage, um, securing the infrastructure, configuration, things like that. Um, and so customers also have expressed a lot of concerns there. It's like, where is my data going? You know, I don't necessarily trust uh, my data going into uh, the unknown or into service hosted by the vendor. And so uh, as part of that effort, the answer uh, that Atlassian is coming up with is uh, creating this new way of, um, uh, of uh, kind of uh, developing on, on the uh, platform, which is uh, something we call Forge. So instead of... Um, uh, partners having to host uh, the apps themselves. Uh, now all they have to worry about is just writing the app and then uh, Atlassian will worry about uh, storage and uh, computing um, on that. So it's just uh, to illustrate one of the examples of how um, based on the feedback from, from the community and from the customer that we kind of influence the product to, to, um, uh, to go in that direction. Cool, so now I just want to uh, kind of briefly talk about other focus areas that we think are really important uh, when building um, an ecosystem security program. Uh, so of course, uh, application security, talk about bug bounty, but uh, bug bounty will not uh, be a silver bullet either. Uh, it's important to have uh, robust processes around manual testing and review, and uh, we really want to build upon that. Uh, also around automation, um, having um, Automating a lot of the tasks is really important um, and also kind of giving that, those tools to the vendors so they can do self-service automation and find vulnerabilities before they even list the app is something we want to improve upon as well. And then the final point here is um, 
Vendor security reviews, and I know this is a bit of a controversial idea, you know, are certifications, are they important? Uh, questionnaires, uh, do they provide value? And in this case, we've um, realized that a lot of customers, they do um, want uh, vendors to have certifications. Um, and so uh, partners actually find this process to be very, um, uh, very, very painful, right? Like you have to fill out this long spreadsheet and it's just a, a really time consuming, painful process. So um, this uh, is gonna be something that uh, we offer to, um, to partners to give them a way to streamline the process, um, just gonna make it more streamlined and uh, give them the ability to quickly fill out the questionnaires and then send it off to customers. So this is um, uh, not quite like a, a way to um, evaluate them from our perspective, but more so give them the tools to, um, to prioritize their security investments and understand the gaps and then give that information to customers. Cool. So in closing, um, I just want to kind of show this illustration of, uh, again, the ideal state that we want to achieve here. Um, and uh, the, the, the main idea here is that um, the security work that we do, that it's not going to be um, unidirectional, but instead that there is like a feedback loop that we create between Atlassian as the platform owner and the uh, marketplace partners, where um, like by doing these security activities, uh, and uh, getting the feedback that elevates um, security ultimately for the customer. So uh, basically, as we do app reviews, as we test, as we invest in automation and security, and uh, uh, partners remediate, um, that enables us to collect data and uh, get a better understanding of what's going on in the marketplace. And then we can use the data to make platform improvements and uh, uh, make changes in our processes as well. Uh, it, for a continuous process to ultimately ultimately benefit the customer in this case. Cool. So uh, with that, um, I'm going to leave some time for questions. And also, I don't know how many of you uh, deal with um, uh, with this problem of marketplaces, but um, you know, I'm happy to chat about your experiences and get feedback and have a conversation of how uh, some of you have solved this problem. But anyway, that's it. Hey, um, I wonder if you have um, some sort of isolation mechanisms that prevents two apps from interfering with each other, both from a, a functional perspective and a security perspective. Uh, I, th I think in the current model, uh, in, in the general RESTful API model, uh, I think it's kind of taken care of by itself to some extent because each app consumes the RESTful API on their own and then, uh, and then they have their own data store and they kind of handle everything else. The challenge is bigger for us in, the, in Forge where we are hosting the commute, computer and we are hosting storage and that's where we are we're investing a lot in sandboxing the apps uh, uh, so that an app cannot end up behaving like another app or trying to get access to data to another app. So that's more of a Forge, uh, Lambda, AWS Lambda kind of a thing. That but, we but Forge is the on the back end, right? Yes. I, yes. I, I was actually referring uh, to when they are running inside the browser. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. They are possibly accessing the same like uh, DOM elements, pro ah. probably running in the same uh, window, or mm -hmm. it might be the case that you are rolling out iframes or and sandboxing iframes. I don't know. I, yeah, I yeah, that's a very good question. That. Yeah, that's a very good question. Uh, Today we leverage iframe sandboxing, right? Like today the apps uh, end up in an iframe and they get their own DOMs and everything whatnot. And then we have post message to to uh, to sort of communicate between the parent domain and everything whatnot. Uh, but we are actually investing a lot more in controlling the UI itself, where we are kind of mandating the UI elements that the app can have, right? Uh, so that uh, at the end of the day, it's it's us controlling the UI and we can create kind of decide the sandbox based on the app identity and whatnot. So that's the direction we are going towards. Iframe sandboxing has been working out well so far. We, we haven't had big issues there. Uh, but this Forge UI is a, it's a brand new thing and like we'll, we'll learn more as we, as we build it more. Uh, so I work for Splunk, so we are very 
<laughs> this is a very close problem to our uh, to us uh, who sets the uh, the scope of the bug bounty for these apps because that the onboarding an app itself we found is uh, is just a little bit of a heck. It, it is it is time consuming mm-hmm. so how did you solve the problem of onboarding a bunch of apps into this uh, bug bounty program setting the scope setting all those kind of things yeah yeah that's uh, i think uh, i think that's becoming like a new services that these bug bounty platforms are offering these days uh, to be really frank we didn't do much work there we just let the bug bounty provider and the uh, platform provider and the vendor to work with each other to figure out the scope we just set some basic conditions uh, and then what ended up happening was uh, our partners saw value in this and the scope actually is for the entire company they just don't scope it to their marketplace apps uh they have their company domains they have their own instances their entire perimeter is part of the scope which is something we didn't expect to happen but it kind of was kind of a sweet surprise for us and and all these companies are are having a proper bug bounty program on that and how did you prioritize which apps to go after first to on oh so we didn't prioritize we went out and made an opt in and said uh, uh, we incentivized it we said we are going to be showing this information to our customers in some form or fashion and that is sort of an incentive for the marketplace partner because it's money revenue for them a customer might end up choosing an app that shows that has a security badge versus not right uh, so we incentivize and we are continuing to incentivize we want to be at a point where we prioritize but i think we are at least like a year out uh, or a few months out uh, where we we are able to prioritize that so you mentioned that you do some manual security testing is that testing that's done by your team in atlassian do you maintain a queue how much do you try to cover all of the plugins over a certain amount of time like how much work do you actually do there manually yeah uh yeah that's <laughs> yeah that's yeah it's struggling with that right now with our yeah yeah uh that's a yeah that's a that's a constant struggle for sure and to be really frank we are a brand new team and we are what about 8 months old so we are just starting to warm up to testing more apps in the manual testing space uh right now it's it's more of a risk based approach more more than risk based like what are the top 200 apps like how can we go after them first let's these are the most used by customers what can we find in them uh, and all those things right now uh, but eventually we want to be in like a sort of a the permissions based model i mentioned where we we have we have more granular scopes more granular permissions and uh, uh, we test apps that ask for the most sensitive of permissions and have some factors around that it's interesting how different companies saw uh, handlers based on my understanding like uh, g suite for example goes by the number of installs and also the the scope that is being asked so the moment you hit like 100 install or something like that that triggers something within google and i'm guessing they go and take a look at it for manual testing so there are some parameters sort of risk based approach they take there i just had a question for you there was uh, you guys presented on a, a slide kind of three different approaches kind of more of like one of like signaling kind of security consciousness and another kind of put in security gates and I'm kind of wondering like what approach because I noticed you guys also said okay there's like these are the basic security requirements so maybe like okay this is like the bare minimum to even get into the marketplace but then maybe like I don't know if you're mandating people to go through the bounty program and if you are maybe are you also signaling security consciousness through that and so maybe are you kind of doing a hybrid of both and you know it's it's very relevant to our company as well we're kind of even we're going through this process right now of trying to figure out the perfect way to kind of do this um mm-hmm. and so just curious on, on what you're doing. Yeah, yeah, I would say it's a journey. Uh we are more on the proper like the third approach. Yeah. Right? Like we are on like let's get a, how many people are possible into the security things that we do. Uh the security requirements we published mainly because uh many of these partners don't even know what they have to do. Like I mean they want to do something, they are like what one person shop somewhere somewhere in the world and they're like I don't know what to do tell me the minimal things I need to go after. So that's one goal of the security requirements. The other goal of the security requirements is enforcing SLAs. We didn't show it in the screenshot, but we can actually enforce SLAs on vulnerabilities we report to partners now. So it's like if a critical comes out, we reach out to the partner and we ensure that they fix it within a certain SLA. And right now it's data gathering phase. At some point we can we can sort of uh take actions like you know we will block your app for a couple of weeks or we will uh escalate this to all the customers installing your app so that there is some carrots and sticks we can use and that's the direction we are going towards gotcha. and i think also kind of important to try to emphasize that um kind of we see this as a collaboration between us and the partners so they are just as uh, accountable for their security as we are for telling them or guiding them towards that security so it's it's a like i said like a feedback loop right so Uh, maybe that's that's the approach we're taking where we are uh, working with the partners to to a better security state as well. Yeah. 
market. Is your approach also just to in, ensure that every partner that's on the marketplace is actually uh, set up through the bounty program too? I wasn't. Yeah, that's like the dream. I would say yeah, yeah. <laughs> that's like the dream. Uh, yeah, currently not. Yeah. Okay. Yeah, yeah. yeah. we're yeah. working towards that. So you were referring only to application security vulnerability. What about malware scanning? Uh, so right now it's primarily cloud apps, right? So there is only so much malware scanning we can do with cloud apps because the infra is outside. Uh, but uh, in Forge, we are thinking about like malware scanning and, and anti-abuse scanning, for example. Uh, there are a bunch of things we can do once we have the code. Uh, but right now, I don't think we have the capabilities to do malware scanning. In I mean, based, on, based on permissions, I guess you can try to figure out more, right? Mm -hmm. And that's another aspect, yeah, like abuse detection and just monitoring logging. That's something that's a big part of it all as well. Um, that's something we're working to do. Yeah. And then I'm curious on the documentation page. You chose that from January 1st, 2020. <laughs> How did it go then? Did you block yeah. suddenly a lot of applications or? No, uh, no. So that's very important. I think we should we want to convey that point. Like you should totally work with the partners uh, if you are really. Uh, we want the entire ecosystem to come up together. Uh, we had a, a long uh, 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 discussion. I would say spanning months, talking about the requirements and everything. And we got a lot of feedback to improve the security posture and all those things. Uh, so we haven't blocked any app, but we have definitely identified a few that violate the requirements, some of them self-identified by the partners and they started working on fixing it. So right now it's like, this is what we'll go after uh, and we are sort of uh, reach out when we find things. Mode, uh, we want to eventually be to the be in the place where we every single app is, is tested against the requirements. Yeah, kind of by design, the requirements were kind of written in such a way that we can scan for them. So they're not broad like, you know, don't be vulnerable, but instead they're uh, more so like you need to implement these things and that we can test for them later. Yeah. So if I, if I understood right, the bug bounty program is something that the partners have to opt into. So do you get reports from third parties about uh, security problems for partners that are not opted in? And, and hand, how do you handle that? Yeah. Uh, do, you, do you want to? Yeah, so uh, we may, so, so it's not in scope. The third party apps are not in scope of our uh, primary bug bounty program, the Atlassian bug bounty program. But if we do get those reports or if we somehow learn that a, a um, uh, third party partner has a vulnerability, there is a, a process to report that to the partner and an SLA for them to, to fix that. Um, and then, you know, if that happens right now, we can also try to convince uh, that uh, partner to, to come join Bug Bounty uh, as well. Um, yeah. So, yeah. And the SLAs also kick in, yeah. like as far as requirements, there are SLAs, so they need to fix it within a certain SLA. Okay, yeah. and, and for the, for the um, partners that are part of the Bug Bounty program, do do you have? Do you let them set the bounties, or, or do you do you set the bounties? So we have a base minimum um, recommended pool, uh, or recommended range of payouts uh, that we ask them to commit to. Um, if they want to increase the bounty, they're free to do so. If they want to tweak the policy uh, in a certain way, they're also free to do so. Yeah. Uh, but but we uh, bec yeah. In order to run a successful program, you have to incentivize the researchers. Otherwise, no one's going to hack at you. You know. So so therefore we. Um, you know, have certain conditions that we ask them to, like a bounty pool of $50,000, for example, that they need to commit to um, for a year, right? Yeah. yeah. Uh, how, how different is the process when a partner updates the app versus when they initially onboard? Like, is the, does the process a redo of the whole thing that is done? Yeah, that's, uh, that's one of the reasons why we went the bug bounty route first, because... Uh, uh, the app is available for testing all the time, and uh, uh, researchers can test the app at any point of time. We don't get on listing or on updates today. Uh, it's an open marketplace, and uh, uh, we don't really do anything special when the app gets updated. But then the bug bounty program is always running. Our scans are always running. Uh, so that should, like, over a period of time, catch any new vulnerabilities that come up. But, but uh, uh, bug bounty, there would be an end date to how long it would run for that particular app, or it goes no, on for a, for the lifetime know. of the app? Yeah, it's okay. like any bug bounty program. The company has its own bug bounty program, okay. uh, and, and it's, it's live all the time. Okay, thanks. Um, I was just curious, like, the size of your team and, and ordering and, like, tackling this problem specifically. <laughs> uh, so just focused on ecosystem security, we are five people. Uh, we're growing to about eight people, so which there we are hiring. <laughs> uh, we're going to about eight people, but then like there is definitely more people we are going after. Uh, it, it also the programs are evolving, and that is kind of uh, defining the needs and for resourcing and budgeting. Uh, so so that's sort of a feedback loop by itself. Do we have any more questions? 
All right, could we give a round of applause to our speakers, please? <laughs>